I dare to affirm with my long years of experience that one of the reasons why many Christians are so unhappy, so unfulfilled, and so unsuccessful in their lives is because they ignore this essential mandate of seeking first the kingdom, and they refuse to expend their energy on the things of God. They refuse to devote their attention. They believe in their comfort, first and foremost. Beloved, if you only serve the Lord when you're comfortable, you're feeling good, then you're not serving him because you're not serving him like Jesus served him. You know, in Matthew 9, we see Jesus talking about his, the, the people, the crowd. He was looking at the crowd and he was moved with compassion because they were harassed and they were helpless and they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were weary and they were tired. They were exhausted. He could see their pain and we should be able to see their pain. We talked about this in last week's episode and today we're looking at a situation where he's confronted with one individual and here again we see him seeing her pain and responding and bringing her salvation. We're talking about the woman at the well. In John chapter 4, Jesus leaves Jerusalem and he's going to Galilee, but he has to go through Samaria. Let's read together. When Jesus knew that the Pharisees heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. He had to travel through Samaria, so he went to a town of Samaria called Sika. He came to a town of Samaria called Sika near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about six in the evening. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, for his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? She asked him. For Jews do not associate with the Samaritans. And then he, the, 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 a conversation ensues between him and this woman. And in the course of this conversation, she finds out that he's the Messiah, the one who can give her living water. In verse 27, it says this, Just then his disciples arrived and they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then the woman left her water jar, went into the town and told the men, come. See a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They left the town and made their way to him. In the meantime, his disciples kept, the disciples kept urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. The disciples said to one another, could someone have brought him something to eat? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus told them. Don't you say there are still four months, then comes the harvest. Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields, for they are ready for harvest. The reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life, so the sower and reaper can rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you didn't labor for. Others have labored and you have benefited from their labor. And then the Samaritans came and they, they, they talked to Jesus and they ended up believing in him. Now this is an absolutely remarkable story and it is so important for us to understand a few lessons from this passage. If truly we are going to be witnesses in this year, we are going to take up our role as we looked at before as persons who devote their lives to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ because that is why he left us on the earth after saving us. We, co we start with the context. Now, this is very important because we just see Jesus talking to a woman. Now, we say, what's wrong with these disciples? Why are they surprised he's talking to a woman? Why wouldn't he talk to a woman? Because of our historical context. But, but when we understand the context of the times, the thing to know is that there's a four 400 year old enmity between the Jews and the Samaritans. Rivalry, enmity, call it what you will. Because there is a, one of the um, understandings concerning the origin of the Samaritans was that they, they, they came about out of a mix of Jews who were left in the northern kingdom after the Assyrian invasion and other peoples who were brought to inhabit the land. There is even a story in the scriptures that talks about the fact that peoples were brought from other nations to inhabit the land after the king of Assyria deported the northern tribe, the, tw the ten tribes, even though the tribe, of Benjamin, uh, the tribe of Benjamin had joined Judah and there were elements of Levi and some of the other tribes that had joined, joined uh, Judah. But let's just say the ten tribes of the northern kingdom 
them were taken into captivity by Assyria, and their habit was always to repopulate and redistribute people within their areas of conquest to avoid any possibility of the conquered nations regathering and rebelling against them. So they brought some foreign uh, nations to inhabit the land along with the remnant of those uh, Israelites that were left behind. And uh, out of the mix of this population came the Samaritans. And so the, it would seem that at one point, according to the scriptures, the, the people who came to inhabit the land came with their gods. And lions invaded the land. And so they got really scared and thought, it's the God of the land that is punishing us. So they sent to the king of Assyria to have priests sent to them, uh, Israelite priests sent to them to teach them how to worship the God of the land. And so there came this mix of people who also claimed to serve Yahweh and claimed to be descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And indeed, it would seem that there are even changes to their history that will somewhat differ from the Jewish account of the uh, dealings of God with them. But the important thing to note here is that at some point they wanted to come and help at the time of Esdras to rebuild, Ezra, <laughs> Esdras in French, Ezra to rebuild in Jerusalem and they would not let them because you have no part with us. No, we don't want anything. We don't want you involved in this work. And so there was a strong enmity that was birthed between them and this enmity had lasted since then. And they actually had a temple on Mount Gerizim where they were worship Yahweh and believe that that was where they were meant to worship Yahweh and that the Jews had it wrong by worshiping in Jerusalem. And one a Jewish leader actually destroyed the temple at some point in history. We'll not go into that now. But their temple, the, the Samaritan temple, so they had no temple at the time of uh, Jesus. So this woman now says, in the conversation with Jesus, one of the things she says, you, you probably know this story very well, is that our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, Mount Gerizim, and you say it's in Jerusalem that we should worship. She started this theological conversation with Jesus, but Jesus went beyond her theological inclination and brought her the word of life and revealed himself as the Messiah. So this enmity was there. In other words, something very un- Un truly unimaginable is going on here that Jesus, who is a rabbi, is coming from Jerusalem. Oh, and why does he go through Samaria? Because when you look at the map of the Holy Land, you realize that the, the, the straight path, the straight route to Galilee from Jerusalem is to go through Samaria. And to it would take a three-day it's a three-day journey, whereas going through another route would be to avoid Samaria altogether would mean something like double the time. And Jesus had no prejudices anyway. He was going to go through Samaria so that he could go via the most direct route to Galilee. And so he stops at this town of Sika by the well because he's tired. And you know, it's really very important for us to realize that Jesus lived as a human being on the earth. He was not floating around on clouds all the time. He he ate like us, he slept like us, he grew tired like us, and yet he was constantly, as we saw last week, on the move to preach the gospel. He was going from place to place. He went through towns and villages and went to synagogues, sat down and taught the people, then got up again and went all night to pray, and then got up again and began to heal and began to He really extended himself physically and mentally to help humanity. This is very important for us to note because that will enable us to stop complaining so much, when we have to work hard for the Lord, when we get tired as we're serving him, or when sometimes we spend a sleepless night because we're doing something that's not done so that God will be glorified. And then we think, oh, we're, so, we're doing so much. But Jesus extended himself and expended significant amounts of energy, and he was worn out. Listen, this, this passage says that he was worn out from the journey. He was worn out from the journey. Now, bear in mind that everything that Jesus did on the earth, he did to fulfill the will of the Father. Hebrews 10, he said it, that he had come to fulfill the will of the Father. That's all that he did. He did nothing for his own pleasure. All that he did was for the pleasure of the, of the Father and for the salvation of mankind. And so when he was worn out here, he was worn out in the service of God. He wasn't worn out because he was traveling to a seaside resort to have a great time. He wasn't worn out because he was trying to visit the great museums 
terms of Europe. He wasn't worn out because it was, he had spent all day w walking through the, the, the beautiful 8th uh, arrondissement of Paris and enjoying the sight. He was, he was worn out because he was serving God. And he sat at the well and he was thirsty. And he was also hungry because his disciples went into the town to get food. It's important for us to contextualize because when we don't contextualize, we just read very quickly through these very salient passages and, and miss the point of what the word of God is saying to us. And we can already see from this passage here, one, that Jesus knew no enmity. He held nobody at bay, even though he was sent first to the lost sheep of Israel. And he said that, he, he said it when the Syrophoenician woman came for healing for her child, yet he had no enmity towards anyone. He broke all the barriers. So we see very clearly here, one, the, the need to break all barriers when we're preaching the gospel. No one is beyond redemption. No one is out of bounds. Any person who does not know the name of Christ is a a legal target for your evangelism and should be a subject of an object of compassion for you. Now, this is where we see again how powerful the ways of Jesus were when he was on the earth. He's tired. He's, he's, he's worn out. He's, he's thirsty. We know he's thirsty because he asks the woman for water. He wasn't just pretending to want water so he could start a conversation. It wasn't a conversation starter. He was thirsty. His disciples went to look for food because he was hungry. They were hungry. And as I said earlier, when I was teaching on this, we, we're, we're currently in that 21-day fast. It will still be when you watch this on TV. Perhaps not when you watch it five years later on, on the internet. But you know, I, I taught on this and I said, Jesus didn't always manifest food. Sometimes he actually went to buy the food. You know, he didn't always multiply. Sometimes he actually went to buy the food. And that's what they did in this instance. And he was there. This is a, a lesson for us. This is the kind of moment that we miss out on. I'm talking about being a witness and, and what we learn from Jesus as witnesses. We learn from him that there are no barriers. Everybody is your audience. It doesn't matter whether they are old, they're gray, the white, the blue, the green, the, every person on the face of the earth is an audience for salvation. Secondly, it really does not matter how you are feeling. He wasn't feeling too good, but he saw an opportunity to win someone and he sees the opportunity. Can I encourage us to go beyond? You see, I'm a pastor and I deal with people all the time and I'm, I'm always amazed at how people feel that it's when they're in a good mood that they should be serving the Lord. It's when they're feeling great and everything is going wonderfully that they should be serving the Lord. Once there is a slight hiccup in their life, um, once there is a, a slight um, disturbance in their otherwise tranquil and serene existence, then the work of God must be forgotten. And, and, and then they act like you lack compassion. You don't understand what they're going through. But you see, the, beloved, the Bible tells us in Matthew 6 that if we will seek first the kingdom, all these other things will be added unto us. And I, I dare to affirm with my long years of experience that one of the reasons why many Christians are so unhappy, so unfulfilled, and so unsuccessful in their lives is because they ignore this essential mandate of seeking first the kingdom. And they refuse to expend their energy on the things of God. They refuse to devote their attention. They believe in their comfort first and foremost. Beloved, if you only serve the Lord when you're comfortable, you're feeling good, then you're not serving him because you're not serving him like Jesus served him. So he stopped at the well. He stopped and he started this conversation with this lady. And, and so we see not only the context of a harvest, we also see the means of the harvest. Now, you will say, yes, I have to distribute tracts. I'm going to distribute a thousand tracts. You know, every opportunity should be seized. When we have just one idea of what we're supposed to do. You know, some people feel, well, I, I am called to young people. And so what we do is we go to campuses. So the day they're sitting on the train and there's an old lady in front of them who's saying, I don't even know what, what, what my life has been about. They kind of listen, distracted. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't see that as an opportunity to share the gospel because they have locked themselves into one single way of functioning. That's not the way we do it. 
You know, every single time that you are available, God can bring someone to you wherever you may be in the restaurant where our restaurants are closed right now in France, uh, in the supermarket, wherever you are, God can connect you with someone that you can bring the gospel to. This is what happens here. Jesus didn't go there to preach. He went there to drink water. And there comes a woman with a, with a bucket. He looks at her. He sees her life. He says, I'm going to teach, I'm going to win this one. Now, the other thing that we need to look at, we're talking about opportunities. We're talking about breaking down barriers. Uh, is the, the, the issue not only of him speaking to a Samaritan, but him speaking to a woman. Now, bear in mind, beloved, that in, you say, well, what do you mean? Why can't you speak to a woman? Well, it was not the 20th century. In the time when he lived and in the culture where he lived, the rabbi did not speak to a woman publicly. And there were some who went as far as to say that the rabbi would not, should not even speak to his own wife and his own daughter publicly. Now, him speaking to a woman was a very shocking thing, which could actually bring cast aspersions on his character. What does that tell us, beloved? It's that we should not love our reputation at the expense of men's salvation. There are situations that the Lord will put you in where you may not look so cool. You may not look so amazing if you were to actually speak out, but somebody there needs to hear what you have to say, because that is what will bring them to salvation. Now we have to forget about our reputation. You know, we have to make ourselves of no reputation so that we can do the will of the father and you to see the kindness of our master. It's an example of kindness. As an example, we see practically demonstrated in this story what Matthew 9 talks about, this deep, heartfelt bowel of mercy, the compassion that he felt for the lost. And it's that compassion that pushed him to, fo- to do away with r- racial prejudices or religious prejudices, to do away with gender prejudices and speak to a Samaritan and speak to a woman. And not only that, beloved, speak to a woman whose life had not not been totally exemplary. A woman who had been married to five men and who's now with a man, she's with him. He's not her husband. Do you understand what that means? She's with him, but he's not her husband. She's with him, but he's not her husband. And so you and I can understand what that means. And in today's culture among Christians, it's still scandalous. Hopefully it's still scandalous. In some circles, it's, it's no longer so. But <laughs> imagine at the time, and, and Jesus spoke to her. Sometimes we don't understand the depth of love that Jesus manifested when he was on the earth. His love was not only in taking away sickness, it was also in relating to people whose society would say he should not relate to. So he speaks to this woman. And this is the means of the harvest, seizing every opportunity. There is no perfect timing, I put here in my notes for you, no perfect feeling. No perfect timing and no perfect target. No perfect timing, no perfect feeling, and no perfect timing. That's why the Apostle Paul said to Timothy to preach the gospel in season and out of season. Just preach the gospel. Seize every opportunity to preach the gospel. And you know, we've been talking about having a burden for the lost. And when you have a burden, it never goes away. It's not like, I'm on holidays now. We've gone, oh, we're in, oh, we're in Jamaica. We are not, we're not doing Jesus here right now. Many Christians go on holiday and they backslide. And you kind of wonder, their faith is seasonal and it's locational. It's when they're in Paris, and when they're, when they're in church, but when they're out there in the south of France where things can happen. No, beloved, there's no perfect feeling, no perfect timing, no perfect location. A burden never leaves you. Wherever you are, when you truly have a burden for the lost, you will manifest that by reaching out to someone. We seek opportunities in daily life. You know, I told a story. I, I, love, I love the stories of D.L. Moody. His story and the stories about him. And one of the remarkable things about this man is um, that he had made a covenant with God to to share the gospel with at least one person each day. And someone tells the story of how they were with him the whole day. He had prayed, he had shared, the, he had, they had shared the, 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 the reading of the scripture together, and he'd been with him the whole day, and it had been raining cats and dogs. It was pouring outside. He had a meeting that evening. And so this fellow was wondering, has he, does he still keep the, uh, the covenant he made with the Lord to share the gospel with one person each day? Because this was years later after he had become very well known, a celebrated preacher. 
future. And so they went out and he was watching him and he called for the carriage. They got into the carriage and he saw the moon. He kept looking outside and he kept looking outside. So what's he looking for? And then finally he saw a woman. He jumped out of the carriage, went to the man and said, sir, where are you going? And the man said he was going to whatever place to hear Moody preach. And when he said, me too, come into the carriage. And he took him into the carriage with him and he began to share the gospel with him. Asked the man if he was a Christian. And the man said, well, he wasn't, but he was interested. And so he shared the gospel with him. And the man finally, he, he led him to the Lord and he gave his life to Christ. Later on, when they got to the hall, he now told his, his, this gentleman who was telling the story, who was with him and told him to please sit that, um, that man they had picked up in, in a good seat in front. And so Moody went on and he preached the gospel. And at the end, he calls on people who have not given their lives to Christ to come forward and to give their lives to Christ. So he turns to this man who he had picked up in the carriage. I said, sir, are you a Christian? And the man said, yes, sir, I believe I am. I pray to receive Christ this, with a man this evening. I believe that man was you. And it's really interesting. Why? Because he, he, he knew that whatever the situation, whatever the circumstance, he could still find an opportunity to preach the gospel. And in the, there in the rain, he saw the opportunity, a man who was going, and somehow by the Spirit of God, he knew this is the right person, got him into that carriage and preached the gospel to him. You know, we, our generation is so flaky sometimes. We are so easily distracted and so easily distressed and so easily disappointed and so easily discouraged. And I believe that, I pray that that is not your portion and no longer will be. That we, our commitments to the Lord are not enduring. Jesus here demonstrated that every opportunity should be seized. And we learned something else. We've talked about the context. We've talked about the means and also the target. And I've mentioned that already. Uh, but just to give you a clear uh, outline of this message, the target, the, the, the object, the subject should be anyone. See that that young man with the ring in his nose and, and with, a, with a purple hair who looks like he's not interested in Jesus and he just might not appreciate it if you were to talk to him. He, talk to him. If Jesus brings him your way, talk to him. One of my, my people was telling me the other day that because we've been doing all these messages on, on having a burden for the lost, on, on, winning, on, on winning people to Christ, they, 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 all of a sudden something was awakened in them and they, went, they were coming, um, going to a place and they saw this young man and began to talk about 20 year old and were amazed at his openness and his friend, his openness. He, he prayed to receive the Lord. Then called his friends and said, you, you need to say, say this prayer. If I remember the story correctly. Yeah. And, and, and a small group of them actually prayed to receive the Lord right there. And sometimes we are not uh, proactive enough because we don't expect enough. I want to encourage you to be expectant. Jesus talked to this woman and something absolutely amazing happened because he seized the opportunity and he did not limit himself to, to, to any particular class of people. He said, I put in here, don't limit yourself to those around you, your family, your sphere of influence. Everyone is included in the harvest. Samaritans, women, the most unlikely people, drug dealers, everybody is included in the harvest. Everybody. He spoke to this woman and because he spoke to her, he spoke to her. The whole town came out to meet him and they left there believing. Now that is amazing. Uh, they left there believing. What a mighty harvest. And we're going to be talking about that later. And the other point I want to raise here, we'll take that in greater length um, in the next uh, program. It's, the, it's, the, it's the vision that we have of the harvest. We've seen the means, we've seen the contacts, we've seen the, 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 the target of the harvest. We, but there's, there's also the vision that we have. We need to change our picture and change our understanding. Because you see, when... <laughs> It's really, it's really amazing. We can look at people and not know what they're going to become or, or what God can do with them. This woman was the most unlikely person that would have been chosen as an evangelist. You and I would look at her and think, oh, this woman, my goodness, she, she must be full of stuff, maybe even demons, you know. I mean, the kind of life she's lived, I don't know. And we may not actually have chosen her. But Jesus spoke to her, and through her, all of those people in that town came out and, 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 came, and came to recognize him as the Messiah. But, and, you know, it reminds me of a story. When the disciples came back, we're going to talk about this later. When the disciples came back, surprised that he was talking to a woman. They just didn't see what he saw. They absolutely just saw a woman, you know, a Samaritan woman. Uh, he, he, he said something to them later, which we read at some point. Where is it? He told them to look up. 
Um, it's, it's translated here in, in the HCSB. Listen to what I'm telling you. But literally it says, look up, look up, look up, look up. Just go, look up and see. Uh, the fields are white with harvest. It says the fields are ripe. So the fields are white with harvest. Look up. Just believe this. This, this is, things are not the way you think that they are. And it's very important for us if we're going to be used by the Lord to change our perspective. A picture of the harvest must change. Our thinking about it must change. There needs to be a renewal of the mind. And th there's a story I started talking about D.L. Moody earlier. He's really one of my favorite people. Um, there's a story told about, it's not just story, it's the truth, okay? Uh, how he was converted. His son is school teacher because he, he'd grown up without a father. He was four when his father died and, and his mother raised them. At some point he went to the city I would try to get a job with his uncle who did want to hire him, but eventually hired him on the condition that he would go to church. And so he began to go to church and go to Sunday school. And at this time, it was about 17, 18. But he was so untaught in the things of God. He was uneducated to begin with, but untaught in the things of God that he didn't even know how to open the scriptures. He, it was all so very strange to him. And at one point, but he sat there and eventually began to see how you could open, he couldn't open the Gospel of John, for instance. I remember that. I was in, in church with a friend one time. I went to invite her to church just after I got saved. And I had to be taking her Bible and opening it for her because she just didn't know where the books were. Don't ask me today. She can preach out, preach you. Uh, and so he, he, find, he had difficulty finding the Gospel of John, but his teacher one day wanted to bring him to the Lord and decided to go and see him at work. He worked in the, shoe, in the shoe store. And he was uncomfortable thinking, well, maybe he would embarrass him if he went in there. And the other men there said, oh, asked later, why did he come? And he now said, oh, he came to preach to me. He might be embarrassed, but he eventually went in. But he was really surprised. He said he made a really weak presentation of the gospel. He found him uh, and spoke to him. And as soon as it was done, well, yeah, yeah, he wanted to receive Christ. And he gave him his life to the Lord. Uh, you see, that is an unlikely situation. That's kind of like the woman at the well. Nobody would have thought that she would believe. Nobody, he never thought that he would believe, but he did discharge his duty and he, and he told him. But the, the interesting thing I want to draw your attention here to here, we're running out of time now, is, is the story of what happened to Moody himself later. After he became a Christian, he then became very active. He started his own Sunday school and, and brought lots of young people. And at one point, apparently, his Sunday school was uh, one of the largest, if not the largest in the country. He had at some point, he had about 1,500 children and young people in his Sunday school. But you see, something very interesting happened because another teacher was going to go to New York, was leaving Chicago to go to New York, and he was sick. He was very sick. He had lung problems. He thought he was going to die. His doctor had said he had to leave, and so he decided to go, but he was burdened, and Moody didn't understand why he was burdened. He said all the girls in his Sunday school, he never brought them to the Lord, that he thought he'd done them more harm than good. And so Moody had this brilliant idea that he would get a carriage and drive him around to the homes of each of these girls so he could witness to them. And so he was really stunned. He'd never seen that kind of thing before. So he drove the teacher to the homes of each of the girls, one after the other. This teacher, who was really sick, would go up the stairs, talk to each girl, explain what he, wa he was feeling about, uh, about not having brought them to the Lord. And all the girls, without exception, broke down in tears and gave their lives to Jesus. He even asked Moody to pray with them. And Moody had never done that before. He was so surprised. It left an indelible impression on him. Ten days later, the teacher announced that he had seen every single one of the girls. They had all given their lives to Christ. Moody organized the Bible, um, a prayer meeting the evening before the teacher left. They all got together to pray. He said if he had known what was going to happen to he himself, he would not have gone to that prayer meeting because at that prayer meeting, he lost every desire to be a merchant and resolved to preach the gospel. And that radically changed his life. A grace was birthed in his life that turned him into a soul winner. And you see, it's very important for us to understand that we don't know who we will be speaking to. Everybody is a target for salvation. The fields are white with harvest and we must let the Holy Spirit direct us. As he directed Jesus to the woman at the well, he would direct you to people, different people. He directed that teacher to go and speak to Moody that day. He spoke to him. He gave his life to Christ. He became a Sunday school teacher and then he directed that other teacher to go to each one of the girls to win them to himself. They were all one to Christ and that changed Moody's life and he became 
became one of the greatest evangelists of his time, if not the greatest evangelist of his century. Beloved, somebody is waiting for you. Somebody's life is waiting for you to speak into it, to release the word of life, to bring them into a close relationship with the Father, to cause them to be, by the power of the Holy Spirit, reconciled to God. I pray today that you will receive this call in this new year to be a witness. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. I may he cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. May the Lord be with you and I'll see you next week. Shalom.